Here's Joshua Benton of the Nyman Lab giving uh, one of the best and most concise surveys of the business model for journalism in the digital age. One problem that news organizations and newspapers, for, for example, had is that they really were a mass medium. They viewed their audience as a sort of undifferentiated crowd. And if you ran a newspaper before the internet, all you really knew is that the people who were reading you were probably not too far away from you and, uh, and that they were willing to pay for a newspaper. Mass media was defined largely by geography. If I lived in Shreveport, Louisiana, the newspaper was going to be writing stories of interest around Shreveport, Louisiana, and the distribution model drove the content. Online, that doesn't happen because geography is no longer the most important element. You don't, it's available everywhere. The web is available everywhere. The apps on your phone are available everywhere. So one problem is that news organizations have a, have a very small knowledge of who their users really are who their readers are. They don't know much at all about the things that they're interested in, what their habits are. Most news organizations really think of them still as an undifferentiated mass. You saw Adam earlier today talking about the New York Times Innovation Report, and one element from it was this, was this quote, currently our capabilities for collecting reader data are limited. The information is dispersed haphazardly across the organization and rarely put to use for purposes other than marketing. This is a real challenge. News organizations don't have good data about their audience. I mean, just think about it. Facebook knows all the people that you know, where you've lived, what content you enjoy, everything that you like across the internet. They, they, can, they know what you buy, where you shop, what websites you visit. Google knows a, a complimentary but awesome set of information. They know specifically what you're interested to, in searching for. They know your email if you use Gmail, all these other things. And they know it across devices, across years. And that has enabled them to become really dominant in the advertising business. This is numbers from 2014 on the share of global net mobile advertising revenue. In other words, ads on phones across the entire world. You'll notice that nearly 70% of all the advertising revenue in the world on phones goes to two companies, Google and Facebook. That doesn't make them evil, that makes them really efficient. <laughs> that means that they have, uh, they have made the business of advertising, which, often, which previously was li limited to publishers who were producing news or information or content, now it's dominated by these two companies. And that domination extends further when you, go, when you look at mobile phones. Our mobile phones are incredibly personal devices. They're all about our messages, our apps. Our, our individual push notifications. They are, they're something we carry with us at all times. That sort of personal knowledge means that we often want to get our news on phones in a social context, in a social network that knows who we choose to follow, who our friends are and what they are, trying to, what they are sharing. That social context, that personalized context is all driven by user data and publishers are at a huge disadvantage for that. You can see it, it, it's, it's particularly true in messaging apps, and it's particularly true when you look at the new wave of devices, such as this Apple Watch on my wrist. These are extremely personal devices that could really benefit from knowing exactly what I know. I've been wearing this watch for a couple weeks now. I have about 20 different news apps on it, and even though some of them provide better experiences than others, none of them really know what I'm interested in because they don't have the data for it. One thing that has happened as a result of this shift is that platforms have an enormous and growing amount of power. So this has led to a trend that in the United States we're calling distributed content. The idea that you're not just publishing content on your own website or in your own app, you're publishing content that is meant to live and exist on other platforms. So in the United States, Snapchat, the very popular chat application for young people, all of these premium publishers, CNN, ESPN, the Food Network, National Geographic, publish content into Snapchat's app. It's native to the app, and they've had enormous viewership and revenue numbers from that. You've already seen this slide if you've been paying attention for the last day and a half. Facebook's instant articles are another version of this, another instance where the dominant force that controls the platform, that is able to control both attention and data, has convinced publishers, don't even put this on your website only, publish it directly inside Facebook, and we'll promise that we'll have a better experience. And on that, it's probably a good choice for publishers to go along with this, but it is an absolute reminder that the war between platforms and publishers is increasingly being won by platforms. I know that's militant phrasing of that, doesn't have to be a war, but nonetheless, there are winners and there are losers in this. 
So what can publishers do? There are a few options. They can invest in making, having better sources of data about their readers. They can hire more data analysts. They can create better internal analytics tools. They can also work together. The Pangea Alliance is a, is a new outfit that was put together by a number of European publishers, including The Guardian and The Financial Times. And what they're going to be doing now is they're going to be sharing data that they know about their readers with one another. So even if The Financial Times doesn't have enough information to really target its products towards you or to target you from, from via advertisers, Maybe with the extra information from The Guardian or The Economist or some other platform, you might be able to do that better. You're still not going to beat Facebook and, and uh, Google, but you might get a little bit closer. So if you're a publisher, if you're a news organization, you need to invest in data. You need to realize that this is another battlefront that, that, you, need to be, that you need to be fighting on. More sharing internally and externally of the sort that the New York Times Innovation Report mentioned. And if you're a reader, it's really a time to support your, your favorite news providers. In the United States, 10 years ago, the newspaper business generated about $50 billion a year in print advertising, five, zero, 50. This year, they'll probably generate around $15 billion, one, five. That's a, dr a huge drop in just, you know, 10 years. That drop is, is likely to, to continue. We are put onto these digital platforms, and at the moment, publishers, the folks who actually generate the content that you enjoy reading, are not at an advantage. They are facing some, some difficult choices. So if you value the kind of news that you get from your favorite publisher, support them. If you can support them by paying the money, they would love that. If you can't do that, or they don't want you to do that, then you can support them by answering their surveys when they ask for information about you, by, uh, by agreeing to register for their, for their service so that they have a better idea of who you are. In other words, we're, we're facing a, a really significant struggle. While data is providing all of these wonderful opportunities for visualization and, and robot journalism and all these new things, these new experiences that could not have been imagined before, at the same time, data is having this difficult impact. And I think uh, if we want good news and good, pu good publishing to continue, we should go out and support our publishers. Thank you very much.